This is episode 41 of the Steady Trade Podcast with your hosts, Tim Bowen. Name your setups. I mean, it can be called the unicorn. It can be the lollipop. And Stephen Johnson. I was a, a poker player. I tried to go professional. I moved to Australia to play. Today, Tim and Stephen sit down with Papa John, who has just been crushing it lately. Yeah, I was, I was down about 16, and then right now, up overall, I'm up about 7,000 right now. You know, he hasn't seen this kind of a hot streak since he was counting cards in blackjack. Are we just degenerate gamblers? Are we? <laughs> I mean, uh, are we just degenerate gamblers who find a, a way? Winning is great, right? But losing sucks, huh? It's bad. Always bad. A losing trade is not a bad trade. Sorry, Tim. I, I don't know what I was thinking about when I said that. What, what are what are you thinking about? You know, some people are just wired to be long. Some guys are wired to be short, etc. So, okay. Well, what does Papa John look for in a stock? I don't look for catalysts because one thing I notice is a lot of companies, when there's a multi-day breakout to all-time highs, the next day the company will put out a press release a lot of times. How do you get your confidence back after you've lost it? You know, I was starting to lose confidence again and I just deleted my four biggest losses and my profits were just going flat without those four losses. What about Steven's French friend Touche? Does he have any burning questions for Papa John? Touche from France says, uh, do you have any animals and which one is your favorite? <laughs> All this and much more on today's episode. But first, let's dip into the mailbag for another question for Tim and Steven. Today's question, how do you scan for shorts and how much planning goes into a single trade? I mean, basically, that's what the question is. I mean... It might be a little more specific than that, but let's see how well Stephen does with this one. Uh, from TBF apostrophe S, TBFs, tip of us, tip of us, uh, thank bloody Fridays. I have no idea what that stands for. But anyway, it says, how do you scan for shorts? How much actual planning goes into just one trade per a day? When you trade today, for example, the one stock trade you do today is that planned over a period of time or is that something you find in the morning or the night before and have it confirmed that same morning? As for time frames, go for shorting. Is it more active in the morning or the afternoon spikes, opening bell or mid-closing bell, or do your scanners find each position each morning? I love how, I love how specific that is. Uh, and uh, well, how, would you, how would you start to answer that, Tim? There's a lot there. Uh, good, good question. A lot to go over here. So again, break it down for me. Let's start, let's let's do one at a time. You threw, um, maybe maybe it's, it's my is maybe it's my ADD day trader mentality. But but I I need you to break that down for me. Yeah. So I think basically it started off by saying when you're taking say you t take one key trade per day, uh, is that trade something that you've came up with? the night before or is that something that you're reacting to in the morning? I think that was the first part. Good question. And I say it kind of depends on where you are at. I've always said for years and years and years, if you're a new trader or a growing trader, your ideas should be from the day before, the two days before, et cetera. You should be working on building the case, creating a trade plan because if you, now, maybe you're an outlier, but as a new trader, if you're trying to trade the, the, the big runner of the day that just pops up at 9.31 a.m., in my, from what I've seen through the years, you're going to struggle. Where I say, look at those previous day's runners, whether it's a long or a short, but you should be have your list of your short list of trade ideas coming into the day and avoid what I call the shiny objects, the big runner that pops up at 9.31 a.m. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, for example, for going long, I, I would break it down into two stages. I, I would look at what was running the day before, and if it's a clean chart with no overhead resistance, and it's not up, if it's up between, say, 15 and 40% on the day, uh, I would look for it opening red, and if it's opening red and it's got a base of support underneath, it's your favorite favorite trade. It's that yep. weak open red to green, bounce off the support, and, and have another leg up. And the funny thing, going just briefly going back to data, I was tracking that as a short, and I realized that 55 to 60 percent of the time, if that was uh, up only less than 40 percent between 15 and 40 percent on the day, and it and it was finishing near its highs with a good base consolidation, 
good 60% of the time that works. <laughs> so, so, so I've started going long on it rather than going short on it. Uh, only on the first green day under 40%. And, and it works a lot. Um, but yeah, so it, there's two stages for me. The first stage is look at what's running the night before and, and say I'll look for a week open red to green. So that's pre-planned. And then maybe the next phase is is, is any kind of multi-month breakout setup, which is day one of the multi-month breakout where you can buy off some sort of level of support. So it really depends on the strategy, but yeah. As but I, right- I say, you know, I, th- we, we, I think we, we went over a lot there, but the, the, basically the two word answer, you know, that, that when it comes, I'll probably exceed two words, but you know, I say previous day, all your ideas, you, that it gives you time to read the press releases. It gives you time to look at the chart. I, I always, when I was getting started, I would print charts, scribble all over them. I would be prepared for that following day, especially as a part-time trader. If you're, if you're, if you're at work, if you're just getting started and you're trying to trade the morning runners, it can be done, but you're going to struggle if you don't have the basic mechanics down yet. Yeah, and, and, he, and the second part of the question, which you've kind of already answered, as you're saying, which is, which is the best time to short? And, and that just totally depends on you and what, what setup you feel comfortable with. Do you like to short the morning spikes, which are pretty dangerous, or do you prefer to short the afternoon fades, which are safer? It just depends. Yeah, for me, uh, you know, the, basically the first, you know, from 2007 to about 2013, 2014, first six, seven years of my career as a part-time trader, that was when I had my business, I significant majority of my trades were those late day fades. I felt like I would watch the open, watch the spikers, and then if I came back at 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., and that stock was un- below the high of the day, was fading into the close, was a quote-unquote junk stock, there was a high probability that that thing would continue to dump into the close and then maybe gap down the next day. You got to be patient, but as a new trader... <laughs> you don't have patience, you know, you're, you're going to struggle. So. Hey there, listeners. The Steady Trade Podcast is powered by Stocks to Trade, the ultimate trading platform created by traders for traders. Now, many of you already use Stocks to Trade. Some of you even use Stocks to Trade Pro and get to hear Tim Bowen every day. So, of course, you know from experience how Stocks to Trade cuts out time and stress of trying to find the best stocks to trade and lets you focus on becoming a better trader in whatever style or patterns fit you best. Now, for those of you who have never tried Stocks to Trade for yourself, we here at the Steady Trade Podcast want to help you out as a way of thanking you for listening to the Steady Trade Podcast. We have a special coupon for you. It's a promotion for the first 300 people who respond, and it will save you 20% off of your first month of Stocks to Trade. So you can try this out for yourself. Now, even if you're not ready to start trading real money, but you want to practice trading in real time to develop your skills, you can use the paper trading feature of Stocks to Trade. It's a great tool for traders, so come check it out. Simply go to our website, steadytrade.com, look for the coupon code steadytrade39, click it, fill in your registration information, and boom, you're ready to start trading. Now, again, this is only available to new subscribers of Stocks to Trade. It's not combinable with any other offers, and there's only a limited number of coupons available. So go be one of the first 300 new subscribers, sign up for Stocks to Trade using coupon code SteadyTrade39. Go do it today and put your trading skills to the test. Welcome to the Steady Trade Podcast. Uh, we're back with another interview that's becoming more and more frequent. And this one is one that I'm, I've been particularly excited about. It's one that I was keen to set up. Um, it's with the, the one and only uh, Papa John, uh, who's with us today. And Papa John's done something pretty remarkable in just the last three, four, five months. Uh, he was a consistently losing trader, not just losing a little bit, like 1,000, 2,000. I think you are down. 16, 17,000 at one point, and, and then within a few months, you've skyrocketed into the green. So uh, before we get into that, I mean, how on earth did you get into trading, and, uh, and what got you motivated, John? Okay. Um, I think that there were a couple other things that aren't directly related to trading. Um, I was into online poker for quite a long time, and I was actually 
um, looking to possibly go professional and then the government shut down all the online poker sites and that kind of killed that dream. Um, and then a few years later, um, I learned how to count cards at blackjack and then kind of the same thing. I, I turned uh, $400 into nearly six figures in about two years playing blackjack. And um, then my son was born about two years ago and with blackjack, there's a lot of travel required to go to different states and different casinos, and I didn't want to do that, so I put that on the back burner. Um, and then how I got into trading, um, I started following Tim Sykes on Instagram, and he, uh, it, it seemed like he was definitely trying to sell something, and I wasn't necessarily uh, you know interested in it right away, but I'd noticed that on the weekends he'd be posting messages saying no days off study hard and you have to work when other people aren't working to get ahead of them and so I was like okay maybe maybe he's kind of legit and then uh, I started looking into his YouTube videos and um, I watched Trader Checklist and I was like okay yeah this is definitely seems like a real you know something that you could actually do and the fact that he had you know other students who he successfully taught um I decided to go ahead and jump in and try it. Um, and it, I kind of like the day that I got my E-Trade account set up and I joined uh, Penny Stock and Silver and I just jumped right in, jumped into a trade right in the morning. Um, okay. I bought like a hundred shares of, uh, I think it was MTBC. Um, it was, I think earnings had just come out and in about five minutes I was up a hundred dollars. It was like 35%. <laughs> um, so just took the profit and I was like wow that was crazy and it's probably not a good experience for your first trade because it can't be that easy and yeah was, that, that 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 I was actually just about to say that I, I kind of I could see the smile on your face and I'm like I'm, I'm I, I I know the story he's gonna tell and yeah that's that uh that happens to a lot of us which is a good thing but yeah it's all of a sudden I know a lot of beginning traders that are like whoa I made a hundred bucks in five minutes there's five hours and 50 or five hours and a half or five and a half hours left in the day. I can make $6,000 today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. But, so, uh, John, just, oh, go ahead. Just tell, just tell people quickly where you're at now. So people know, cause some people may not have known you. They might not have heard the Tim, saw the Tim Sykes blog post. Where are you right now <laughs> with trading? Um, well, so I, so as you said, I lost, it was just under $16,000. Um, over my first six months and then things finally all turned around I got my setups um, down and then over the next about eight weeks I made thirty three thousand dollars from that low point um, and then in February and March were kind of rough and I took some big losses I didn't cut losses quick enough and uh, right now I'm up about seven thousand dollars still overall and up about twenty two thousand from my low point and and just timeline wise from the from the point you know you you mentioned you opened that e-trade account when yep. when was that so that was last may oh okay yep. so okay. i'm it's i'm about 11 months into this you're 11 months in and you're up about what you're up about 11 12 grand but you were originally down about 16 17 yeah i was, I was down about 16 and then right now up overall i'm up about seven thousand right now very nice. I mean, again, that's, you know, um, that, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on because it, you know, it's great to get the people that hit the ground running and, you know, and are up a ton of money, but your journey one year in is way, way more common than the guy, you know, obviously we, we all, we all wish we were Roland Wolf and did what Roland did, but he's an outlier. There's a lot more, guys and gals out there like you sure yeah and i don't you know i really don't know how anybody could be profitable from day one unless i guess if you put in a lot of study time beforehand you know in which like i say i didn't do that i just jumped right in and started trading from the beginning i figured i could follow alerts and i would make money that way and then i would learn how to trade and of course <laughs> that doesn't work <laughs> But uh, uh, Tim, Tim, I don't know about you, but I mean, it's crazy how common it is that um, the like, like I, I was a, a poker player. I tried to go professional. I moved to Australia to play. 
Roland was a black jack player. Alex Twenty One, I remember in an old DVD hearing that he was very into poker. Papa John's in a blackjack. I mean, are we just degenerate gamblers? Are we? I mean, are we just degenerate gamblers who find a, a way? I, I, you know, in good question, you know, I don't, I, I've never, other than just, you know, like hanging out with buddies when I was younger playing poker, I've never, you know, uh, played poker a lot. I've never done the online thing, but no, I, I think a lot of, I, I think it's very similar. I mean, you're, you're looking for, you know, patterns, you're looking for setups for lack of a better term, you know, you're dealt these cards and it's like, and, and you've got to then reinterpret what everybody else at the table is doing. And it's a lot like trading. Now I do think there is a little bit of that juice, you know, that, that does bring a lot of poker players to trading for sure. Yeah. Well, I think, well, uh, I think that they're real similar, similar in, like I always, I tried to gamble with an edge. So with poker, um, you know, it took me a while and just playing with my friends before I found the good strategy to be able to actually win. And then I was cons- a consistent winner for like six years with online poker. And the same with blackjack. There's a certain, you know, if you're counting cards, you have a small edge against the casino. Um, but I think also both of those things helped me really understand like statistics and probabilities, um, expected value, and just like what having an edge means and how, you have to exert your edge over the long run to actually, um, you know, have a profit because any individual trade or any hand of poker or anything is random um, by itself. But if you have a small edge, then over the long run, you should be profitable if you have bankroll management also. And so that's, that was a big thing learning with trading, especially is risk management um, and just position sizing, because obviously if you lose all your money, then you're out of the game. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest values, and again, I'm, I I've never was an aggressive gambler or anything, but I think it, the, one of the best lessons it gives you is is losing. You know, you're, I mean, even if you're, you know, the, the World Series of Poker, you've still lost thousands and thousands and thousands of hands, and trading is like that. You, a, a lot of newer traders, you know, they, I, I'll talk to them on a daily basis, and they'll be like, you know, I had this idea. I had this trade plan. I lost. It was a terrible trade. And I'm like, no, you know, you, 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 you broke this down. You had a plan. You stuck to it. A losing trade is not a bad trade. And I think that's what poker and it teaches you is that sometimes, you know, you just, you don't get the cards. Yeah, definitely. And that's, I think even um, for me personally, blackjack taught me that more because with blackjack, there's only like one correct decision to make. And you're going to lose, the edge is so small that you're losing, you actually lose more than half of the, half of your hands. Um, but with trading, that's still, that's still my biggest issue, I think, is cutting losses. Um, I just, you know, I, I think I just want to be right, I guess. And, you know, you're, you're not going to be right on every trade. And that was a big part of my turnaround was when I finally understood how to cut losses, um, how to choose like levels to risk off of, um, instead of just saying, I'm going to risk, when I first started, I was saying, I'm going to risk 10% and I'll try to make 20 to 30%. And that was way optimistic and risking too much. And then I, so I lowered the percentages and that still wasn't working because if you're just risking a certain percent, that has nothing to do with the chart. And you really need to, uh, you know, if you're playing the chart, you're using technical analysis, you really want to use like a key support level, let's say to a risk off of. But, but John, so just talk us through, because this is the million dollar question. Like when I said that I was going to have you on the podcast, we had like a, a flurry of tweets of everyone wanting to know your secret and wanting to know your strategy and, and how you got where you were. So, I mean, if you could answer that for, 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 the, for the millions of Papa John fans, um, how, how did you, your pattern's multi-day breakouts. How yeah. did you find an edge on multi-day breakouts? What did you do to find the edge? And, uh, and then how did you turn it successful? Okay. Well, so from when I first started trading, um, I was tracking all of my trades in a spreadsheet, um, but I wasn't tracking my setups. And so that was part of it is um, after I'd seen Tim Gratani mention that that was how he turned profitable was he found a couple setups that worked for him. Um, So I started tracking all my setups. I thought I already knew a couple setups that I felt like I was good at, um, but I was just tracking all of my trades 
uh, just in, like together in one spreadsheet. And so once I started tracking setups, I slowly started pulling out trades so I could see how I was doing. Um, I really thought that like morning panic dip buys was um, going to be where I could find an edge because I was really good at identifying them and identifying the bottom. But um, since I'm not good at cutting losses, that's, <laughs> that's a bad pattern to play because I would <laughs> buy the dip and it would bounce a little bit and I would want more and then it would fail and then I would just hold and hope. And sometimes just hold till the next day and it's just going down all day. Um, but so I eventually, after I had tracked for, it was probably two or three months of actually tracking all of my setups um, and then splitting them all up by setup. And I just saw like, okay, these ones I'm not profitable at all. And then I found, oh, multi-day uh, breakouts I'm actually have been some of my most, most profitable plays and some of my biggest gains. Um, so at that point, um, I was down $16,000 out of uh, about 24000 that I started with. So I only had like $8,000 left. Um, I'd lost two thirds of my account. So I was like, okay, I'm profitable with this setup. I'm just gonna play this setup. And I'm only gonna play perfect charts. Um, you know, I want like, I want them to be breaking out to all time highs, like no resistance overhead. Um, it's nice if, you know, if it's lined up with a, a 52 week high from a few months ago. Um, but just really just, you know, I knew that that was, that was the one setup that I could easily identify and I was profitable with it. And so I just focused on that and, um, just really quick. I mean, it was only six weeks. I got back that 16,000 that I'd lost. Crazy. So, uh, <clears throat> whoops, God, sorry. Cleared my throat right in the mic. Um, a couple things, a couple great points I want to point out there. Number one, it is amazing to me. And I don't know if it's like, maybe we should, we're, we're, we're having Brett Steenbarger on in a, in, a, in a week or so. Maybe we should ask him, but I don't know if there's like some psychological reason why so many traders think that what isn't, it. what isn't working is, is their, their setup. You know, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> it the right way. You know, they, they all, they almost yeah. always I end up doing mistake. what doesn't work for them. You know, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's like you you said, Hey, the multi multi-day breakouts work. And then you go back and you're like, geez, I'm barely ever trading these multi-day breakouts. I'm doing other stuff. And I hear that a lot and it's interesting and I don't know why, but that is the big reason to do exactly what John did. You know, we talked about it in past episodes, name your setups, whatever they're called. I mean, it can be called the unicorn. It can be, be the multi-day breakout. It can be the lollipop, whatever name you want to name it. Track those and see which ones work consistently because I see it over and over and over again where guys aren't, they aren't trading what works for them. They, they, they trade those the less, least. So, uh, but, but the funniest conversation is you say to people, why did you take that? Why, uh, someone's like, oh, I keep on losing all the time. What setups are you trading? No, I'm just trading this setup, this setup, this setup. Do you, do you track the data on that? Nah. Do you win on it very often? Nah. So why are you trading it? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> there's, the, there's the answer to your problems. But isn't it funny though, like uh, Papa John lost 16 grand, started trading one setup and made it all back. And it was the exact same with me. I lost six grand. Thought I can't lose anymore. I just need to find out one setup that works. Found one setup, tracked the data and made the money. If there's anyone out there who is losing, and the one to turn it around, I mean, Papa John, what, what would you say to them? I mean, I already know the answer, but just so they hear from someone else. Yeah, I mean, that you have to find what works for you and then just focus on what's working. And that's, it's something I'm hesitant because people ask me because they've seen my success, they want to know the specifics of my setups and how I find my trades. And that's not really relevant to other people because everybody's different. We have different um, risk tolerances and, uh, you know, we'll just different trade setups are going to fit different people. And um, you really just need to find out what you're best at and then just focus on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, we, we get that a lot, like, especially like the, the Stephen Ducks episodes, um, which we'll, we'll have Stephen on at some point, but we got a lot of comments where people were like, we didn't, you know, we want to know more his exact setup. And it's like, well, I mean, what works, you know, Ducks is primarily, uh, he shorts parabolic stocks. I mean, it's a, it's his strategy. It, it's what works for him. It's a dangerous strategy, but 
it only, you know, it, it, that fits a small set of people. You know, everybody is a little bit different. You know, some people are just wired to be long. Some guys are wired to be short, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think that's a great, great point. Yeah, and speaking of that, that was one of the first um, things related to this that I noticed was um, this was before I started tracking setups, uh, but a, I don't know, a few months into my journey, I did notice that I really suck at shorting. And um, I think I've, I've won like 25% of my shorts and I've, my losses have been, some of my biggest losses have been shorting. And so that was something early on. I was like, oh, I, shorting is just not good for me right now. Let me just cut that out. Try to just focus on long. Yeah, but so I mean, just talk us through the process. I mean, I know you don't want to, there's no point going to specifics of the technicalities, but just how did you narrow down your edge on the, on the multi-day breakouts? Like how did you, as you're saying, uh, I realized my risk was a bit too large and, and stuff like that. Uh, how did you kind of hone it in to get the perfect multi-day breakout for you? Um, so I guess um, initially it was, I just found out the multi-day breakouts in general were good. Um, I did, then I started breaking them up into listed breakouts and OTC breakouts uh, nice. because those do, uh, they just play quite a bit differently. And um, with that, I noticed that I'm a lot better at OTC breakouts because they tend to, they trend a lot, a lot better. Um, NASDAQ breakouts are a lot more choppy. Um, so I don't know. I really, it was just, so I have all of my trades for OTC breakouts and I, I see my win percent and um, like my risk reward ratio. So how much my average win is compared to my average loss. And that kind of gives me my edge. And then I used, based on that, I decided like how much of my bankroll, um, how much of my account I should use per position. And I think that's part of also why I was able to win the money back so much. Like as soon as I found, okay, this setup is definitely profitable for me. I started going uh, what I would consider full size for my account. And then so it, kind of every day or every week as my account was growing, I was sizing up bigger and bigger. Um, and then that eventually... Uh, was a bad thing when my account got too big and then I couldn't, uh, I couldn't cut at the risk level I was expecting. I wanted to risk $1,200. And then when I would have a trade go against me, it's like, I don't want to lose $1,200. And then I didn't cut it. And then I took a $5,000 loss. Yeah, no, I've had that exact same problem when I've tried to size up, like when I got overall profitable, I started sizing bigger and bigger and I just could not accept couldn't accept being 600, 700 down on a trade. I'd just like, I'm not taking a $700. loss. <laughs> I'm not taking it. <laughs> I couldn't. And then I'd lose two grand. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Have you learned from that, Tim? Tim, do you, how do you learn from that? You just keep on losing until you can't take yeah, it Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think the, <laughs> uh, it, it's the, the best answer I can give to you is at some point, And that's why, you know, we talk about showing up every day, grinding, grinding, grinding. But at some point, you just get sick of the big losses and you're like, I am not going to do this anymore. I'm, I'm sick of this shit. I'm not going to sit here with an upset stomach and sweat because I said I was going to lose, you know, I was going to risk 500 and now I'm down 1500. You just get to the point where I'm not going to do this anymore. And I mean, it still happens to everybody. You know, sometimes news comes out, you know, you're, you're like, L you, you could have been long LFIN, you know, a couple of weeks ago when it was going crazy, it gets halted. I mean, stuff like that still happens, but day to day you get that experience and you just, over time, you just get to the point where you're like, I am not going to turn this 500 into a $5,000 loss. I'm not going to do that shit anymore. Yeah, yeah, fair play, John. I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've still got a couple of thousand, five, couple of couple of thousand dollar losses in us. Probably, <laughs> I still do that stuff sometimes. But, but is there any kind of specific criteria that you like for the multi day breakouts? Like, is it crazy volume? Is it low float? Is it specific sectors, catalysts, stuff like that? Um, you like no, the weed stocks, eh? Yeah, yeah, I do. Those those just ran so well, like towards the end of the year and right into the new year. Um. And it looks like that sector might be heating up again here. Uh, so I'm not, I definitely, I don't look for catalysts because one thing I notice is a lot of companies, when there's a multi-day breakout to all-time highs, the next day um, the company will put out a press release a lot of times. So 
you know, that helps. And that becomes a catalyst, catalyst, but I'm already in the trade before then. Um, I do want to see increased volume over, like, if I'm looking at, like, a daily chart for the last year, I want, like, you know, the last week or couple of weeks to be, you know, quite a bit of increased volume. Um, so it, a lot of times it was something, ha there was a catalyst, you know, maybe last week and everybody jumped in the trade and then it pulled back and consolidated a little bit. And then when it goes back to break out, that's where I want to get in. Nice, nice, fair, fair enough. Uh, do you have any, do you have, I'll, I'll jump to some Twitter questions, but is there any advice that you can uh, give any of the new people out there to, to start learning, to not maybe lose as much as you put yourself through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the biggest thing is to, until you find your edge and until you know that you're going to be consistently profitable with the setup, trade small, like trade really small. Cause that was something I was, I was kind of um, just gung ho about it. And I, I honestly, I didn't think it was going to be as hard as it was. I thought like, you know, a couple months of losing maybe, and then I'm going to have it and I'll just be able to make money. And it's nothing like that at all. Like I still, you know, I still have a lot to learn. Um, so that's the biggest thing is just to trade really small. And at first you're going to have to try out, you're going to have to lose a lot of money or not a lot of money, but you're going to have to lose a lot of trades um, to find what works for you. Cause you're going to, you do have to try out the stuff to see what's working um, and to just learn how to identify the different setups and just get time just watching charts. That was a big thing. Like after six months of like looking at sock charts every day, um, I just got a lot better feel for how they move. And you know, if, intraday if something is happening i can kind of tell oh it looks weak and you know it might be about to crack and now i can get out um and when i first started i had no idea like it seemed like it was just totally random yeah i think that's a great great tip and something i talk about all the time is you know if you're new your goal isn't i mean i know it's hard to say i mean sure everybody wants to make a million bucks today but if you're new your goal isn't to make money that's not why you're doing this your goal, so, so you're trading 100 shares, 200 shares, whatever. What you're trying to do is make consistent green trades. And if that means you make 50 bucks today, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to live on 50 bucks, but that's not your goal today. Your goal is to try all these different things, track everything, and then six months, nine months, year, whatever it is, you can say, okay, now – this is what works for me. Now I can start sizing up. But if you go in with that attitude day one of, you know, I'm going to retire tomorrow, man, you're, 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 you might get lucky, but odds are you're going to struggle. Yeah. And, and, and John, before I jump into some Twitter questions, where would you, where do you, how do you feel like you are now with your trading? I mean, what, what are you forecasting for the next six months, 12 months? Are, are you exploring new patterns? Uh, oh. uh, are you improving in other areas? Yeah. Well, so I had thought, I felt like I had the multi-day breakouts down pretty well. And so I was just starting to get into other patterns. I also, so I had been under PDT and I'm still under PDT now. Um, I initially, when I started, I had, I opened up a whole bunch of accounts uh, so that I could, you know, have a lot of trades and that was a bad thing. And I eventually narrowed it down to just two accounts and then um, I grew those and then sometime around the beginning of February, I consolidated my accounts to get over PDT. And it was right when the market had its big correction or whatever. And um, at the same time, I was starting to branch out because I think a lot of other setups, things like uh, a dip buy, let's say, you need to be able to have a day trade. Like, you know, you're not going to swing trade that. And um, I don't think, I think it's, difficult to be trying to play day trade setups without having enough day trades available because um, it's going to influence you cutting losses or trying to rebuy it if it fails the first time. Um, I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot. What. No, I, well, one, one, one comment I do want to make is that that is, I think, that's what, that's what annoys me about the PDT rule is because, you know, and we, we've talked about this on past episodes. We had one specifically on the PDT, but it's funny because it's almost, it's like, it's like I'm from the government and I'm here to help that, that classic line. You know, it's like, I think the PDT forces small traders into worse decisions, you know? So now you're like, okay, 
I'm holding a loser. It's my last day trade. I'm going to ride this thing overnight. And then it just gets worse. So that's a great point. And if you haven't listened to the, the day trade PDT episode, I think it was a pretty good one. Yeah. And um, okay. Now I remember. So yeah. So I, I was starting to branch out into other patterns and it was right when the market got like, you know, real choppy. And so that was probably a bad time to branch out. And then um, also, like I say, I was sizing up really big and I was having trouble cutting losses. And so I, I, I had about another, it was probably close to another $15,000 drawdown over February and March. And um, it's when the market went highest. Yeah. I know, I know a few people who have took big drawdowns over February. Not, not so much March. No, it's, March was a good month for, but January and February were, were February, no, February and March were tough. Yeah. Very yeah. tough. Fe- months. Fe- the market I, just changed. I, yeah. I, I, I joked. I remember, I remember it was like February 10th, or, or no, it was like March 10th. And I'm like, will February just get over? I I was making jokes about February being 40, 50 days long because February was brutal. And then it bled a little bit into March too. Yeah. Yeah. So my, like the OTCs like really quieted down. And so I wasn't having those big winners. And so I was pushing things more when I was having a good trade, I would try to hold on to it and then turn a winner into a loser. Um, And then just a couple weeks ago, you know, I was starting to lose confidence again and then I noticed I went, I have, you know, on my spreadsheets, I have a, my profit graph and I just deleted my four biggest losses from February on. And my profits were just going flat without those four losses. And so I realized that, that, you know, it was a big amount of money to lose, but it was just me uh, not being disciplined on those four trades. And then, you know, a little bit of just trying out other new patterns. And I knew I was going to, maybe be losing, um, you know, trying out some different things. But so I decided, nope, I got to go back to just my one pattern and, um, you know, make sure I'm super disciplined on cutting losses. I sized back down and now, uh, now it's coming back up. And uh, I think it was yesterday. I just had my biggest trade ever. I made $3,500 on a uh, CANN. Nice. Awesome. Killer. So yeah, now, but, uh, now, before Stephen gets to the Twitter questions, I have one question I'd like to ask. So, because I think everybody will ask this, you're down. Well, 16, well, what's your favorite pizza? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, I wonder. We we might with the podcast, we might be able to get you like some sponsorship app, which you should have done, John. You should have like came on the podcast eating a Papa John's pizza. Maybe, maybe they would have contacted you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, so so you're down sixteen thousand. Two thirds of your account is gone. Did you consider quitting there? You know what? What was your mindset? Was it? Did you know that this was a journey, or 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 were you? Where were you at? What 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 got you through that? Did you consider quitting? Um, I would very briefly. I had thoughts of quitting, but. Uh, overall, no, because um, that was also something else that I learned from Blackjack is that if you say your bankroll is this size and you're betting, on, you're basing your bets on that bankroll, you can't lose half of your bankroll and say, oh, no, I quit because then you, you really weren't playing with that full bankroll. So when I went in with the amount of money I did, I was uh, willing to lose it all. And I, if I would have lost it all, I probably would have you know, saved up some more and kept trying at it because – um, I definitely, I felt really confident that other people can do this and, um, I've, I've been successful in a lot of other areas where, um, you know, not everyone can do it, but where it is possible. And so I never, I never thought it was something I wouldn't be able to do. Um, I just didn't expect it to take as long as it did. Which in the grand scheme of things, I, you know, and we talk about this a lot, you know, we, we've had, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we always talk about like Gratani. I mean, I mean, it, it, when Gratani was 11 months in, like you are, he was probably up a couple thousand bucks like you are, you know, that's what I, I always kind of bring up Tim because I look up to him and he's a friend, but you know, I always want to remind people of that. You know, if you're, if you're just finding consistency 11 months in, you're up there with some of the best of them. Now it doesn't mean you'll get there, but it means you're in similar company. Yeah. And, and John, you've obviously done this with a full-time job as well. No, I mean, for the yeah. of Gertani, no, no discredit to him. Cause he's one of the best traders ever. 
but he, he was full time and he had that eight hours a day every day screen time and that's that's one thing that people don't realize i mean uh, for my first year i didn't have any screen time i was just watching tim sykes silver lessons i, I don't know about you john but it, it, it is unbelievable the difference if you can if you can see the market yeah it definitely makes a big difference um so i always i have like thinkorswim mobile on my phone and so i'd always have like charts up on there you know on that work but that was another thing like having to deal with full-time job um that was why swing trading the breakouts was good for me because it was something um, where there was a less, less chance of like just a big collapse. And I was able to just, you know, enter sometime in the afternoon, like a lunchtime or something I could buy it. And then I have an hour in the morning. Um, I can trade for the first hour of the day before I have to go to work. And so I'm able to exit nice, very nice. during that, very nice. that time. But that other, you know, I would, sometimes I'd be playing those massive runners and I'd get like a good entry on some stock that's, you know, ends up going like 200% or something and I'd be in it and I'd be up and then I get pulled into a meeting and then I come out and it's, it's collapsed and I'm down, you know, 30%. And so I learned <laughs> that's, you know, I, I, I definitely needed to uh, factor into um, my trading, like, you know, what my schedule was and, you know, to not let things like that happen. Yeah, I think that uh, what, what, you know, if you're a new trader, particularly a part-time trader, listen to what John just said. It's something we talk about a lot um, is looking for those, you know, that John's setup is what I would, is exactly the type of trade I would tell every new trader that's trading part-time to look at because it doesn't mean they all work, but your odds are so much better, especially when you're in and out to look for those charts that are all lining up, all the stars are coming together, and the odds are they're not a 200% runner. The odds are they aren't going to drop 70% after you enter them when you got to walk away for a minute. So lo I love that multi-day breakout, especially with news, et cetera, for new traders because even if most of the time, well, not most of the time, but a lot of the time, if they don't work, they just kind of go nowhere. And then you can kind of be like, oh, okay, I'm, I'll exit this thing for flat or a small loss. Where if you catch them, if they do work, now you're, you know, you're consistently profitable. And worst case scenario, you know, you just cut them because they don't go anywhere. So, yeah, that and that was a big thing that helped me with just cutting losses because of what you said. Like, if the breakout fails, they usually don't just collapse. They're usually still going to hover around, like just below that breakout level. And then, you know, and you know the breakout failed, so the trade the trade's over and you can just exit. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Your, your plan is you went into that saying, if this breaks out, I'll write it. If it fails to break out, my, my trade plan is busted. I move on. Yep. yep. Okay. John, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll fire some quick fire questions at you. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll try and put you under pressure without putting you under pressure. <laughs> uh, see if you can answer them in like three or four words and I'll, and I'll quick rapid fire them. <laughs> It's uh, it's uh, something on the podcast we've never tried before. I've just decided to do it right now. <laughs> but, <Okay>. uh, <laughs> some of them will be Twitter questions. A lot of them will be Twitter, but I don't want to go on and on about them. So just three, four words on each Twitter question, and I'll throw some random ones in there. Okay. Uh, gotcha. and, and Bowen, feel free to chime in with any random question that you can think of. But but first of all, what, what job do you work at? What's your I'm job? So at? I'm a software engineer. Ah, very nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, what is your biggest win, Papa John? Uh, it was that $3,500 on CANN ah. yesterday. And, and what's your biggest loss? Um, that was a $5,000 loss. Um, I think it was LIGA. Um, and what's your favorite? LIGA? Yeah. Go on. And what's, what's your favorite ticker? I'm sorry. Uh, what's your favorite sector? This, this is going uh, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, you know, you know, Stephen. Typically, anytime we we give you a, give you any sort of responsibility, it it typically always goes bad. So you know, don't don't feel bad. So, uh, the cannabis sector is my favorite. Cannabis sector is your favorite sector. Okay, Andrew, Andrew F F A E L. How do you how did you manage to keep on pulling the trigger on trades after even though you're having red trade after red trade after red trade? Um. I learned that it was just part of the process and I just had to work through it. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Thomas cases, ask about entries and resistance. He's playing off. Are you buying strength? Or are you buying dips? Um, I usually buy a dip after the breakout. I'll wait for the pullback uh, for that confirmation. 
Nice. Stephen Johnson from England, uh, living in Dubai, says, uh, is, is uh, Papa John's your favorite pizza, and why is that your name? <laughs> it's <laughs> not my favorite pizza, and uh, it's my dad's name also, so I was named after him. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, John Wilson says, there's a great chance I can pull myself out of my minus five, 6.5K that I'm down. How long have you been, were you trading before you got consistent profits? Uh, it was the six months. Six months. Um, Kaiba Naraj, how much of his trading is technical and the patterns that he trades and what time of day does he normally trade? How long does he hold? Yada, yada. Um, it's pre- like 90% technical technical analysis. I, I don't look at fundamentals. Um, most of my breakouts will hold either overnight or two nights max. Uh, Touche from France says, uh, do you have any animals and which one is your favorite? <laughs> no, no pets right now. <laughs> no pets right now. Uh, good question, Ryan... Touche. Good, good question. <laughs> uh, Ryan Harrison uh, says, I'd like to know when his profit chart was just going down and there was others who seemed to be winning more and sooner. Did he, did he ever think I'm just not made for this? Uh, no. No, I just, I use other successful people as inspiration to see what's possible and i knew that i'd get there one day okay curtis day says ask him how he adapts to a changing environment or if he had to at all i guess the answer is not very well for both of us yeah yeah not well (laughs) (laughs) uh francesco trefino says which are his favorite patterns in this current environment um it's still it's the otc multi-day breakouts and, and nice, probably uh, with with a with a focus on marijuana cannabis type stuff, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Just because there's nothing else really moving right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Ben Dova said, "Where's your favorite battle cruiser, aka boozer, aka watering hole, aka what's your favorite drink that you like to have?" <laughs> um. Well, my favorite drink is a uh, India Pale Ale, IPA beer. Um. Got. God bless you, Papa John. Is that with a pizza or is that nothing to do with pizzas? That's always, it's good with pizza. It's good with everything. <laughs> Love it. Will Kell says, questions around mindset are also good. Insight, how do you carry on when you're losing? Do you ever end up chasing your profits back? Oh, um, I did during this most recent downswing in February. That was part of the problem. I was trying to get bigger winners than I should have because of the losses. Um, otherwise it's just yeah i think i i think that's a great tip for everybody is it it, it's always so counterintuitive but so many traders do the exact opposite of what they should do they they when they hit that losing streak they hit that rough patch they start sizing up because they say oh geez i'm down three grand this week i'm down five grand this week so they start adding size the right thing to do is to scale back. If you're, you know, if you're down five grand this month and you're trading thousand chair, 2000 chair lots, that's when you scale back to 500 or 250 or something like that. And, you know, start stacking up those green trades. But I mean, we all do it. I've done it many times. You see that big loss or that bad week and that, and you start pouring more size on, which is just more gasoline on the fire. Uh, and just one last question. Hussein Kasawana says, uh, ask him in the start of his journey, did he ever feel like he was the Hawkins of trading? He just got it faster than others. Did I ever feel like I was the what? The Stephen Hawkins of trading. <laughs> you guys know Stephen Hawking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah we dead. know Stephen Hawking, but the way you pronounce that sounded like... <laughs> I think John and I are on the same page. We had no idea what you were talking about. Okay. Did you ever yeah. feel you're the Stephen Hawking's of uh, trading, John? Uh, definitely not. When I started out, um, once I had my really good run, I thought that you know there was something maybe a little special, but I I don't know. It was probably just the whole just good sectors, Bitcoin and cannabis were running, and I was just making good plays. Uh, last question how many hours do you think you have to put in to be successful or how many hours did you have to put in before you started seeing profit are you talking eight hour study days four hour study days 30 probably, minutes uh probably closer to like eight hours a day 
like all day on the weekends. Um, you know, I trade in is all I think about. If I'm not at work, I'm studying, going over charts and, you know, reading books, watching videos. So you're studying eight solid hours every day and then all day on the weekend. So this is kind of your whole life. Yeah, it is right now. Yep. So yeah, and that's the difference between a lot of guys who win and a lot of guys who don't. The ones who are walking to work, thinking constantly about tickers, trading setups, going to bed, thinking tickers, trading setups, uh, even going to the toilet and the shower. That's all they think about at work. Uh, you're going disappointed if you have a bad day. You're going over the moon thinking I'm going to quit my job one day when you have a good day. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to believe that these are the people who make it in the long term, though. Yeah. So, John, I, I appreciate it for sure. I think this was good stuff. I really wanted, you know, I really was looking forward to this because of, you know, where you're at in the journey and the fact that you were able to recover from from that dip. I think a lot of traders are gonna you, you're you're gonna you're gonna see that. It might be the first month, it might be a year in, it might be two years in, but um, you know, you can Google those, you know, road to success memes, and there's a million of them. It's never that straight lower left to the upper right. There's a lot of I like the one where the guy's like on the bike and he like falls into the fiery pit and then he's like getting you know getting bit by vultures and then he eventually <laughs> makes it to the top of the hill. But uh trading's a lot like that and, and congrats on on battling back. Oh, um, thanks. Now I, on uh are you I don't wanna I don't wanna say it because I might say it wrong, but give us your Twitter handle and your profitly handle so people can kind of check you out. Uh yeah, on profitly it's uh, Papa John. And uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at Sublime Trades. That's what I thought. I thought that's what it was, but I didn't want to say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> nice. and, uh, and, and, and Papa John, just before we we'll close out, uh, do you want to do you want to say some sort of uh, your, some sort of inspirational quote or some sort of empowering statement just to just to leave people feeling really motivated and, and proud of you and me and Tim and the world? Do you want to just say some life mm-hmm. message? Anything sustainable about the world? Oh, well, maybe not about the world, but <laughs> about trading. Just something that helped me is that uh, good trading is not about being right; it's about trading right. Do you know? Do you know what just had Eric Russell on, and he says he wants to trade like a robot. Would you concur with that? Um, yeah, yeah. If you have rules set up, if you can just follow your rules exactly, uh, that's you'll probably make more money. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, the robot analogy is, is pretty applicable, but I, you know, it's like, I always say, you know, that's why we talk about plan, 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 write it down. You know, I talk about the index cards and stuff like that. I mean, nobody goes into a trade saying I'm going to lose half of my account, but people, (laughs) but people lose half their account. So the more you can be robotic, the more you can be, you know, write things down and and discipline and stick to that. I think the, the higher the potential for your success, because, you when you once you start justifying it it only gets worse so again would like to thank john for appearing on the steady trade podcast uh, make sure to check him out at sublime trades on twitter and then also if you get a second go to steadytrade.com we'd love to have your questions we had a bunch of them that were submitted for john today hit that submit your audio send us a question via audio we'd love to play them or just shoot us an email with anything you would like us to go over or even a potential guest or if you would like to appear on the steady trade podcast we uh we like to you know our goal is to have traders all across the spectrum if you're a new trader you're finding success or you're not feel free to hit us up. We'd love to have you on. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time. Hi, this is Jeremy from Zimbabwe, Africa, uh, currently living in Texas. And I like to clean the house while listening to Stephen and Tim on the Steady Trade podcast. I actually don't. My wife's just in the room next to me, but uh, brownie points, you know what I mean? Uh, You can register to win real actual prizes at their website, steadytrade.com. And if you really like what you hear, Give the podcast a five-star rating and write a glowing review on iTunes like I did. And this is how we say goodbye in Zimbabwe.